This is the Smart Buildings Academy podcast with Phil Zito, episode 222. Hey folks, Phil Zito here, and welcome to episode 222 of the Smart Buildings Academy podcast. And in this episode, we will be talking with Tyson Suter from Siemens. He is the Global Business Development Manager of Digitalization at Siemens. That's a mouthful. And in this podcast interview, we're going to be talking about a lot of different things. We're going to talk about the controls hierarchy of needs. We're going to talk about the future of integration. We're going to talk about actually implementing implementing smart buildings. We're going to talk about digital buildings, digital twins. We're going to talk about why folks would want to retrofit and upgrade buildings, why folks would not want to retrofit and upgrade buildings, why buildings seem to be stuck in the dark ages, and a couple other things. So this is a very action-packed, I wanted to say webinar. It was almost like a webinar. It's a very action-packed podcast. We're going to have a lot of details in it, a lot of really conversation around smart buildings. I think you all will learn a lot from this episode. We'll get a glimpse at kind of where the future is heading, how things are done in other parts of the world. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the podcast interview. Okay, folks. Hey, I'm here with Tyson, and Tyson and I are going to be talking about today. We're going to talk about a couple things. One, we're going to talk about smart buildings. We're going to talk about use case scenarios versus uh, space-based design philosophies. We're going to talk about the actual uh, funding of smart buildings technologies, especially in today's environment. So before we hopped on the recording, uh, he and I were just talking about our thoughts on a bunch of different things. And the thing I want us to dive right into is around smart buildings. And one of the areas, see, I'm on the US, Tyson's over in Europe, and he originated, originated, is that, that's maybe <laughs> originally from yeah, uh, from Australia. So what happened is he went from an environment who I've heard not just from you, Tyson, but from multiple people is very ad hoc mm -hmm. to an environment that is very structured. And now we're here in the US, me, um, over here in the US, everything is custom. Everything is, they, they want the gold plated custom thing. They just don't want to pay for it. So Tell me about uses and scenarios of smart buildings, what you've experienced and your thoughts on that. And we'll just dive in and we'll dialogue about that. Yeah, great. I think you nailed some points there already. If you, my background, I did automation in Australia and, and integrations and smart building integrations. And during that time, there was never a system that was designed for our market ever. So it's always, hey, we've got these products, can we make it work in Australia? Does it, and then we kind of, you know, hack together this solution and make it work. Now this is, it fits into our culture, I guess, as well, where we're happy to have a go, as we would say, um, have a crack to be really Australian. Um, uh, but really it's saying like, we're comfortable with a little bit of unknown. So it really means that my experience, I started doing everything from, installing air conditioning physically to mm -hmm. running the cables to the control systems, rewiring boards, programming controllers, commissioning. That was my normal job. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't have like a team of people that would come and run cables for you. I didn't have a team of people that would come and install the controllers. I didn't have programmers in the office programming controllers. So it was very much, you learnt the cycle from start to finish, which I think is awesome to train on, but mm -hmm. probably pretty inefficient. Um, yeah. But I, I personally, I love this experience. So for me, it was great. Um, but that means we're also, when there's a scenario where you, where you have to like integrate data from multiple systems, yeah, fine, not a big deal. We've had to deal with the unknowns for so long. We don't need a prescribed solution. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably one or part of the reasons you see so many Australian startups is because we're just willing to have a little bit of a go on a new topic and, and come up with our own option. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't say this is a, a overall positive thing, but it's just a reality. Yeah. Um, but in America, I, I, I think you kind of nailed it as well. There's always really impressive new solutions that I've seen there, North America in general, um, where they will solve a problem. 
themselves and they'll make a new solution and it will be hey like we're solving this brand new problem and they they turn something really they turn something over very quickly and when mm. i first come to switzerland in in, in the siemens um i started working with all the regions of the global headquarters and you can mm. really feel these differences so they, and it's hard to cater for a global audience straight away mm-hmm. for anything from product to services but in each country they have very different approaches to it but in general and this is very generalized europe they expect to have a solution and it has to be defined for that scenario mm-hmm. it has to be documented it has to be defined it has to be tested and it has to be suitable so mm-hmm. if you have customization outside of this that's when it gets a little bit less comfortable um, but we're seeing a change because mm-hmm. the digital market's moving so quickly. They have to be a little bit more flexible. And mm-hmm. I, even two years I've been here, I've, I've felt that change, really have felt that change. And I think it's, it's everyone. So, but I, it's, it was really interesting to me to see just how defined and like how um, large the offering mm-hmm. was for this European market. And I'm sure America has a lot of offerings too, but so many options to choose from and so like niche solutions mm-hmm. but there's enough market to justify it very interesting to me so i got a couple <clears throat> questions on that so first off um when i hear that one thought pops in my head so i did some work with uh the middle east and mm-hmm. i know we had to have very packaged solutions because in the middle east what was interesting to me is that in certain countries the actual citizens did not do the work. They utilized outside labor to do the work. Um, I've heard, although this could be my ignorance, in certain countries of Europe, they actually, since it's more open borders, more immigration, um, I, I would say liberal, not in the sense of liberal versus conservative, I mean just more of an open immigration policy. Do you tend to find that because of that, you have to have more systemized products due to just the workforce is, you don't know kind of what background. Whereas in the US, we have, I'm not saying it's an effective education system, but we have a predictable education mm-hmm. system, meaning we, we pretty much know what people are going to learn. And versus when you have, to your point, many, many different countries, many different languages, many different cultures. Just, I mean, I, I think of, for example, I think it's uh, Israel where they read right to left mm. instead of left to right. I mean, just little nuances like that impacting UI design, impacting layouts of submittals. I mean, what do you see from that perspective? Yeah, it's, that's a, it's a really good question. I think it's in Europe, they have the level of expertise in is mm. so high. Uh, mm. Going into a factory or a building, there's always like, an energy engineer in that factory who's an expert a highly skilled highly trained but they're very focused on what their topic is and same mm-hmm. with the facilities teams these these teams are like they know this topic and they know it really well and they're highly trained uh, the education level here seems to be i think really high mm-hmm. um i think in australia there's there's some differences where we you know kind of a bit more of a jack of all trades where you have not mm-hmm. so much focused on one topic where they have that's that person's job and that's, and they're an expert at it. Interesting. Um, but then you go to across Asia and then uh, varying, varying, varying levels um, mm-hmm. of either skill sets or education levels or whatever it may be. There might be some remote site, uh, uh, remote work, or it could be all on site. There's certain mm-hmm. parts of Asia where they, you know, automation systems aren't common. So bath systems aren't common. And um, I've even seen scenarios where, um, in my previous life where chiller plant controllers were just switched off and they were still running everything manually. Yeah. Yeah. So Asia was crazy. Real interesting to me because it certain countries in Asia, they literally just throw bodies at, at the yeah, problem. Exactly. I mean, I've, I've been, and they have 200 to 400 people operating a building manually to your point, or they put an automation system in and yet culturally they still open the windows yeah, and even they turn out the building. They control water flow manually. Like yeah. as the chiller ramps up, they're up there, you know, adjusting water flow for cadenza loops or chill water loops. It's, um, it's crazy. Even when I worked, first worked in North America, I was surprised by how much, uh, how many people were in these buildings working on the facilities teams. Mm-hmm. Um, the Australian market's very lean. Like we, 
basically most commercial buildings will have no on-site staff, just cleaners, security guards, no technical mm. on-site staff. Very uncommon to have on-site staff and it's all third party. And you might mm. have a facility manager managing multiple big, large scale commercial buildings. So very different markets and it's, there's no, yeah, there's no, <laughs> even across the world, you have to kind of cater for these. Uh, labor prices make a big part of it. Energy prices mm. play a very, very large part of what you offer. Um, so those are the two factors you really have to think at, at like a base level, like what, mm -hmm. how much are they paying for labor? How much are they paying for energy? Does this equate, does this affect our calculations? And it does definitely. What about uh, the state of real estate? Meaning in Europe, from my experience, a lot of buildings are already built. I saw a ton of VRF systems when I was over there yep. um, due to space constraints. How does that approach contracting and delivery of product. I know we're a little bit off smart buildings, but we'll get there a roundabout way. I'm we'll happy just... to talk this as well. Don't worry. Um, it, I, it's the systems are entirely different. Uh, the heating mm -hmm. systems completely different. District heating is very common. Geothermal mm -hmm. becomes very common. Um, the EU has some very strict uh, sustainability laws. Mm -hmm. Even, even my apartment I'm in now has, by law, double glazing. Anything that's built today has to be triple glazing. So mm. when you're talking about thermal insulation and how these systems are designed, mm. another level. Um, so you, you can't just, again, even mechanical designs, I, could, it, I had to adjust to how these buildings are built and designed. Same components, mm. of course, but uh, very, very complex heating systems, not so much cooling systems where mm. Australia where have basically no heating. Um, yeah. So it's it's really interesting, and I, you can see that so many great things they do here, and you think, why isn't this done elsewhere? Mm -hmm. um, and and probably vice versa. It's 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 kind of just defined by the history. Like, okay, we've done this, and we've improved on this. Let's continue doing that. But a lot of it comes down to statutory requirements. Mm -hmm. What has the government or the body and entities, in in this case, EU, um, the Euro European Union? Uh, basically enforced through either fines or through initiatives and very successful. And Switzerland takes it another step further. Um, but mm -hmm. same with Germany, they do some really great things as well. So yeah, it's really these two, it's, you, uh, you know, any topic we talk about, it's going to come back mm -hmm. on to how much does it cost and what's, and, and, and do I, do I need to do this? How much does it cost and what's the payback? So if, if the government forces you to do it, you're going to do it. But if the government put, uh, puts a price on carbon or increases electricity pricing, then mm. the, the, it all comes down to, okay, there's a, there's a benefit here. There's a mm. cost, but there's definitely a benefit. So talk me through what is the average size of a building at which point you'll go and implement a smart building solution? And what does a smart, the average smart building solution entail? Yeah, I, I love, you know, smart buildings have been around for a while. Mm -hmm. um, it's usually, I, I don't go off size anymore. I used to, I really do. So I used to say like 30,000 square meters or what's that, 300,000 mm -hmm. square feet approximately. Mm -hmm. um, I used to do that. that. And you'd say there's so many floors, this much space. Um, yeah. But to me now, it really does, it comes down to what, what do they want to achieve? Um, mm -hmm. So I always speak to the customer and say, because it's easy to say oh, you, everyone needs a smart building. Well, they don't. Um, what they need is, and you talked about this recently, but I always say to them, what are you trying to achieve? Are you an A grade building? Are you a B grade building, C grade? And then how do you define that? So do you want mm -hmm. to have a high tech end tenant where you want a fully leased building and there's a certain market, maybe an enterprise customer or a tech company. Mm -hmm. So in that case you say, okay, well then you need to have people engagement, you need to have so through some some form of 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 communicating with the tenants. Um, mm -hmm. You need to have a very you know vertical transport that is destination control. You need to have a connected system of you know security, fire, lighting, BMS, mm -hmm. and then you need to have services on top of that. And they're going to be around sustainability, um, digital twin if you're coming from a certain period of time, but not always. And and that's there's no one answer I think, but. And then you can kind of scale it down. And every building owner should have this digital blueprint of, mm -hmm. I want to achieve this in my best buildings, and I want to be able to scale that down to an appropriate level for, for my smaller buildings. And maybe, you know, a, 
a three-story building in the middle of nowhere, you don't need an automation system, you, but you do need to monitor the electricity consumption. So bringing that back, sure, through utility billing, you might not need sub-metering, but it, yeah, it's, I think there has to be some sort of customized approach and it has to be based on what's realistic. We don't want to um, oversell to these people because it, it turns people off the benefits of a smart building. Um, so yeah, I always, I always look at it and say like, where are you today? And then where do you want to be? And then let's define your categories of buildings. So okay. yeah, pick, pick your big stack, your, your high priority ones, get all the technology you want into that and then scale it down. Just logically okay. scale it down. So let me summarize what I heard from you. You look at use case, mm -hmm. which I agree with you on that. The I, I will push back in that I agree with you that use case should be used to classify investment in smart building technologies versus square footage or versus project funding. Mm -hmm. I, I completely agree. However, if I am someone who can't envision use cases, and let's be honest, there's there's Tyson here, and there's probably a couple people who have somewhat of your skill level, but what I've seen as being the persistent challenge to technology adoption in buildings has been the average salesperson mm -hmm. does not know how to sell digital technologies. They do not think in terms of use cases. We are still very much, in my opinion, and, and we're not even talking about the contracting tier yet. We're not talking about specifiers. S just from, or sorry, not talking about owners and specifiers. We're talking about contractors here. We're talking about OEMs here. A lot of the salespeople are still widget sellers. Yep. Yeah. Um, so the question becomes, and so I was sitting down with a, with a contractor, uh, earlier this year at their sales conference, and we were talking about smart buildings and the question becomes, how do you take someone who, and I want to come back to the technology stack, but I want to go down this rabbit hole real quick. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you take someone who is a widget seller and teach them to sell use cases. I, I have my opinion on how you do that, but I'm curious your approach. Yeah, it's it's the conversation I think I've had my whole career too, because you're working with highly technical people uh, or automation uh, maintenance technicians or facility managers, or, and it's always coming down to either they're so far onto this trendy technology discussion mm -hmm. where they're not understanding how to get there, or they're so into this technical weeds of, oh, it can't be done. I'm still over here selling a product and a sensor. Um, I think the conversation always has to start with, one, a fundamental understanding of the problem. And that's, that's none of this is easy. I, I, I don't think there's like, here's, here's the solution, off you go, sell those people. Um, mm -hmm. So they have to understand what a building and then what the, the use cases mean for that building. And then they have to understand the value to the customer. And I always have this kind of discussion with people where they say, you know, we've got to simplify it. I understand that, but we cannot get away from the fact that we have to teach people to understand what this means. And, and people will learn mm -hmm. about this. It's just going to take time and it's going to have to take understanding from um, discussions like this or interactions with building owners. To be able to say slowly, this you know the technical part or you know the technology, the digital technology part. Here's how we get there. Here's the value. And I always just come back down to what's the value to the customer. So if you walk up to a customer and try to sell them data analytics, you need to understand why they want to buy that. Mm -hmm. Because there's no such like you can't just sell. You can't live off a name anymore. You can't live off a company name. You can't live off a product. You have to be able to under explain what the value is to, to the customer to what you're selling. Mm -hmm. You can't just pull out your price list and read it to the customer anymore. It, and it will work to a point, but it's getting less mm -hmm. and less likely to work. So that's on the front end. What about on the back end of actually, and I know this is a loaded question, but um, being able to maintain those technologies because, all right, so what I'm hearing you say or what I'm thinking is let's just pick one or two use cases, one or two technologies, get our sales force 
sufficient in that and have them execute that versus a whole super crazy smart building that probably comes from a specialized group to deliver that. Um, but then my experience has been, all right, we get someone to adopt analytics, we get someone to adopt integration and the operational side of the customer is not involved. So they don't maintain the system. That's been one of my biggest dilemmas of smart buildings is they seem to be funded through marketing dollars to <laughs> get a marquee, hey, look at what we can do. Yeah. But then as soon as like the edge building, they they bragged about, I know that's like many years old now, but they bragged about all the data points that they could consume. And I'm just sitting there thinking, my God, that poor operator and all these data points. <laughs> I, I mean, I thought the act of simplicity and integration is to take all that data and make it less data points, not just be like, we can monitor everything. Yeah, I, yeah. I fully agree. And I, if, like, if you look at a modern building now, you probably like a modern 30,000 square meter office building. I would mm. expect to see 85,000, 60 to 85,000 data points just on the BAS system. Mm. So if you say to someone, we're going to collect all of that data, yeah, there's someone that's going to have to do that. Um, so there has to be value there. And it always comes back down to me is like what we're doing now is saying, if we sell product, say if, it, say if you're just selling a controller, if mm. your use case, the end use case is to, to control a single equipment then sell mm. a controller that controls a single equipment. If mm. your end KPI's use case is you want to enable data analytics or energy reduction, okay, well then you're going to need something that has connectivity and maybe Mm -hmm. centralized network so it, it really has to to me it always starts with as a customer what do they want to achieve and then mm -hmm. where the technical voice our market say i'm from an automation background so that's mm -hmm. up to us to explain them well then this is what you need to be able to get there and then the the responsibility for anyone selling to these customers is to say okay so you want data analytics do you want data analytics or do you want a dashboard or do you want savings on your maintenance budget? Do you want energy savings? Or it, 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 I, I think there's so many scenarios. Like if someone comes in and says, we can save you 20% energy, it's only gonna cost you $5 million replacing your plant. Okay, but is there anything I can do before that? And I think that as an industry, we have that responsibility to say, okay, let's make the best use of what you have today, because that's the most sustainable thing you can do. Mm -hmm. Starting, stop replacing everything all the time tune things to a certain level and then look at further options. And I think what we do now is like, okay, we need to sell something new. I, I, mm. don't, I don't like that approach. I think yeah. it's, there's a use case for when you need to replace things, but there's mm. a huge opportunity just to get the things in the buildings today working better. And that, that, there's always a, a level of requirement for certain technical solutions, of course, but mm. we have to be more honest about these conversations. So I think this conversation has been interesting and I don't know if it's intentional on your side or if it's due to the questions I'm asking, but we've been talking about analytics. We've been talking about energy efficiency and we've been talking a little bit about integrations. But if you go on LinkedIn or you look at the marketing, it's heavily about integrations, all these crazy integrated use cases. And it's almost like analytics and data normalization outside of digital twinning and stuff like that has taken a backseat. Mm -hmm. And that's very interesting to me because it feels as if we've just said, hey, F it. We can't figure out how to get analytics to really work operationally. We can get them installed um, we can get them going, but then getting people to adopt them and use them as part of their day-to-day -day process is kind of difficult unless to your point, it's regulatory compliance. So we're just going to go right to integration and smart buildings and use cases. And I feel like that's a big miss because to your point, and you hit the nail on the head there, um, I feel as if we're running buildings inefficiently. We are, there's so many facility staff that are running around doing the exact same thing they did 30 years ago from a maintenance perspective. So why not fix that before we go and want to modernize? I, I know that was a little diatribe, but 
What are uh, your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I, I, to me, it's my, I, I think I didn't even answer your question before, which is you're yeah. going to see a pattern of me doing that. Um, smart buildings to me is taking physical and, and manual processes that we do today yeah. and using technology to do them better. Everything yeah. else, that, that's the value of using a digital approach. Everything else is like nice to have, and, and they, but if they don't have a direct link to an operational saving, that's a hard use case to sell in my opinion. Um, yeah. So I'm always, when I see these, these new technologies come into the market, I, I would say like technically I'm pessimistic because I understand the <laughs> effort me, me too. <laughs> to do it. But if I can, and if I can draw a operational savings to these technologies, I become, mm. I'm optimistic that we're going to get there and they will mm. eventually happen. But I'm also, yeah, I'm realistic where you say, what does it take to get there? How much of our market is acceptable for this, this offering? So mm. I think if you go to any, any of our smart building um, solutions in the market, mm. it always, the value to me always links back. Can it save maintenance cost? Can it save operational cost? Can it save energy? Mm -hmm. That's the payback. If it doesn't have that, or is it going to improve the space for my tenants? Because if it improves the space for my tenants, then it has lease value. So that's another yeah. payback. Yeah. So if you, if you, yeah, if you, you know, if you do a fit out, it's not going to save you energy, possibly, like a, let's say an architectural fit out, just like, you know, mm -hmm. for facades and things, but it increases lease value. I yeah. feel the same way, and there's studies that link this. If you improve the conditions of a space, there is an inherent lease value linked to that. Um, yeah. So, but, you know, historically, it's always been energy savings only. That's the only thing mm -hmm. people will look at. Now, people are talking, looking at operational and maintenance savings, and they have for a while, but the reality has been there for, I would say, five, or five to ten years now. Mm -hmm. And then now people are caring about health, well-being, and that's really something. And then, <laughs> I wonder and, why. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it, it, you always talk about like productivity increases, it's, but building owners are always, always reluctant to look at that. Mm -hmm. And then the last one and the biggest thing we're going to face over the next 10 to 15 years is sustainability. Carbon reduction is no longer um, a, a talked about subject and not a, a, an actioned subject. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it, the pressure is coming from that government level. And once that happens, I don't care where you stand on this topic or, or the audience, I mean, sorry. Um, but it, it, it's no longer a discussion point. It's just going to be, okay, we have to do this as a business. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's an interesting point because I think people get, especially see it over here in the U S people are very independent. I mean, myself included, I'm very libertarian, so I'm very independent and like, leave me alone. But the fact of the matter is, is when there is regulatory compliance, you either comply or you pay a fine. Exactly. And so you might as well understand how to service that because you could say, hey, I disagree with the topic, and that's totally fine. That's your right, you know? Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is that if you're not thinking about how do you service that topic and how do you pivot your business to deliver to, in your case, sustainability, then there are competitors who will figure that out and they will deliver that and they will message around that. And it's all about messaging. So, um, interesting point though that you bring about the tenant experience um so people i don't know how it is in europe but at least in the u.s you see a lot of commercial building operators who are talking that people are going to reoccupy mm -hmm. but i don't think that's going to happen like they think it is because i mean we have a completely remote workforce at our business and i mean it seems to be that you can get a lot of stuff done remotely. There are a need for ideation and collaboration. I would argue that some of that can be done via technology. There's like the other day, my team and I were whiteboarding ideas and we had a digital um, whiteboard yeah. that we were doing digital sticky notes onto. So we're doing ideation mm -hmm. with a digital whiteboard in, in a Google meet. Um, that being said, Let's talk about the tenant experience and let's talk about tenant retention through technologies. And specifically where I want to go with this is you used to work for Willow. I'm talking to Willow later today to learn more about digital buildings or digital twins. I feel I used to think that was vaporware and I used to think for the longest time 
That is the stupidest idea. That that's just <laughs> digital twin. I yeah. mean, really. Um, but now I have students asking about that in our courses. I have students asking about Microsoft BI and how to do business intelligence. Um, so my thought, though, as I've learned more about digital twins, is using it to analyze existing assets and project retrofits based on efficiency, based on modeling versus using it for new construction. Mm -hmm. So two questions there. One is the tenant experience, driving people back in, what technology is appropriate? And the second question is, I think we're going to enter a retrofit market due to the health and IQ and sustainability requirements. Is digital twinning a logical solution for low cost retrofit projections. And it's almost like IPMVP. I don't know if you guys have that over in Europe. Mm -hmm. And, you know, option D, which was the whole building modeling, it's almost like that, but seems to be less difficult. Yeah. So, so all right. There's, I'll take them in two parts too. So the first one is how do we engage with the tenants? I think for the longest time, our systems have been built designed and sold to engineers that's mm -hmm. just the way it is and i still firmly believe a certain portion of our systems have to be that way for the mm -hmm. for, for quite a while i think but until we have some more anyway that, that's another topic but um the, the engagement with the tenant i think has to happen with one transparency so i use this word a lot but just you know you talk about like single pane of glass and all these kind of systems um I think there's a value there in terms of showing people the data, but I think just translating what the building does into mm -hmm. some sort of rating system or understanding uh, some sort of data that they can understand, be it like a conversion to mm -hmm. how much money they saved or trees planted. Um, this, this is really good. And I think the best system that I've seen so far is some sort of rating tool. Like mm -hmm. you talk about Leeds or BOMA or, Bream or Wells or Reset. There's all these different rating tools for buildings. And mm -hmm. I, when I first saw these, I thought, what's the, like, really, why are we doing this? But um, <laughs> you <and me> both. <laughs> now I've really learned that it's, be, it's not for us. It's, it's for someone that walks into a building and says, wait, is that good? Is that a good rating? And then what happens is lease, when lease negotiation happens with a non-technical audience, they don't mm -hmm. go, how much energy are you using per square meter or like what's your mechanical plant? They'd be like, what rating do you have? And that's, mm -hmm. it simplifies the conversation. And, and then, and the, that plaque at the front of a building for whatever rating tool you have, that increases lease value. So it is a successful system. Um, so I think that it's very important to have these because it creates a measurement stick. And I, but the, the, when I disagree with them is when it's not a fair measurement stick, when mm -hmm. you can, you can kind of, uh, your it. way yeah i don't like that at all but i do like the fair fair measurement systems where you it's 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 you're rated on what you do and that's that's how it should be um so i like these and i think that's important so engagement with the tenant starts with like education so mm -hmm. what are we doing and why is this a good thing to transparency show me why you what one what you've invested in the building and what effects is it having for me in my in my in my in my workspace um, meaning healthy, yeah. uh, safe, energy e efficient. So all of this has to be clearly translatable to to anyone. Um, and then that that breeds accountability. So that means that once the tenants have the education, once they have the, edu the transparency, now they're going to hold you accountable, which means that's going to breed a market. And that will then dictate what is mm. a good building versus a bad building. That like gives me goosebumps. That's really interesting because I feel like that's a problem we haven't solved no. is um, like, how do you make competitive value out of technology? Mm -hmm. And that's interesting. That's why I like, I, I've been really, I thought about this for, for so long about these rating systems. We have one, and I've spoken about this a lot, but there's one in Australia be called Neighbours, and it's just an energy efficiency rating. Hmm. And government kind of enforced it on office buildings, and it was created by consultants, engineers, they're brilliant. And they just said, it's a fair system. So it's like energy per square meter, 
Um, there's a couple of like exclusions you can do if you have data centers or whatever. But mm -hmm. basically, it is a very, very fair system. And mm -hmm. what did that do? It created an energy market. It created a market of technology providers, of automation providers who said, we will reduce your energy. And then they found a way to measure it very, very effectively, not just through raw energy savings, but compared to similar building types, which is what really matters. If you can prove you're doing better than your neighbor, that's going to create a, a, a dollar value for, for any building mm -hmm. owner. And so I think it's, it's, there has to be something like this. There has to be some sort of, here's the evidence that I'm doing well. And that's, and that's mm -hmm. what we need. Um, and to your second question with digital twins, <laughs> I nearly forgot. Can I pause you on that before you answer that? Yeah, of course. You, you brought up, uh, this is like, I, it would be very interesting to mind map out this thought path here. <laughs> uh, as, as I look at my notes, I'm, I'm taking notes. And um, what about, and to your point of rating of building systems, so I've always been interested in taking other industries and applying them to ours as much as possible. One of the things that technology industry does well, specifically the infrastructure, is the concept of work packages and kind of a baseline stack with modules added on to mm -hmm. it. What are your thoughts on an industry adopted kind of baseline stack of, of this is what we think this space or this building type looks like? And then, because I felt like one of the biggest challenges that we have as an industry is if you go to do, for example, uh, data services or network services in the IT industry, you have baseline designs. Like for example, network, you have the core distro and access layer of a network. That's mm -hmm. your basic three-tier network design. And then you have all the people who can plug into it. You have the Cisco's, the um, Dell's, the et cetera, right? And or not Dell, someone else, uh, Juniper, that's right. So you have these people and they can plug in, but it seems like in smart buildings, we do not have that. And it seems like a standard around that would be very valuable. I think, uh, I think there's two, when you started speaking, I kind of like fully agreed straight away, one, mm -hmm. but I think there should be a standard on what is smart building and what, what does this entail? And that, because at the moment, I think people get confused. And I, I think you, there needs to be some sort of like base understanding, like this, this is what you need for a basic building, more advanced and technology stacks, like in terms of infrastructure. Um, and the other thing is standards in our industry. Um, uh, yeah, we definitely need this. But we've had some successful, and this is a very, um, I guess, controversial stance maybe for some, but BACnet, is incredibly successful in my opinion. I, I know its flaws before everyone screams at their monitor, um, but it has created a huge leap forward to what we had previously. And, and people always, I think, downplay the fact that we are a slow industry in terms of installing new things. The, mm. capital, the, the capital investment and the life cycle period is long. Mm. So I think BACnet's been very successful, but if we had a standard that actually talked on a IP layer, like a native IP layer, like a proper network. Yeah. And that was, that was the only thing we installed. That would solve a large portion of our problems. Oh, completely. And, and it, so I've been rallying against BACnet SC. <laughs> I think it is the stupidest idea ever. I, I think we've got all these secure technologies that are common to IT. And we are trying to bastardize them into some BACnet SC system. So I know a lot of people disagree with me, but that's fine. I'm used to that. The thing is, is what I don't think people realize, you, you realize it, I realize it, but what people don't realize is our technology stacks are tightly coupled with our hardware. Yeah. That is not the same in the IT industry. You know, Folks who are developing APIs like Google and, and weather.com or whatever, who have their weather API, Google has their search API. They don't care whether it's on a Dell server, an HP server, an mm. EMC, does not matter. We are so tightly coupled with our hardware 
that if we release to your point, I think like an API, an HTTPS API would be perfect. Folks argue, well, what about the strong data typing? What about all the functions that are built in the backnet? You could easily replicate that with post and get and put and delete and all that stuff. The thing is, is what what becomes the challenge is all the hardware out in the field where you would have to do a massive firmware update. And it has to be a different firmware for every OEM's product. Yep. And I feel like until we decouple um, hardware from software, we will continue to be in the situation where we need a backnet. We can't. We have to have strongly typed services mm -hmm. because we are coupled to hardware. Yep. When we're decoupled from hardware, then we can have loosely typed services. And to your point, that opens up. I get really excited about this because <laughs> <Me too. laughs> uh, it opens up the developer environment, which yeah. we always talk about having. If we could just get IT and Silicon Valley to develop on our platforms, we'd have such innovation. But we can't have such innovation because they can't develop on our platforms because everyone there's no standardized API. The first person who figures out how to develop a true technology uh, software-based platform for controls and gets wide-scale adoption to use that platform is going to like own the market. It'll be very interesting. I I I love this topic. This if anyone that's spoken to me before this is all I talk about. This, this, this. If someone can solve the problem of taking all these systems and then just leveling the playing field, saying, yeah. "No, nah, we can talk to them," and I think RESTful is very, very. I think that's kind of where I'm thinking. But there's a couple of other solutions that I've heard and have been talking to people about. Oh, yeah. But, but the same concept. Conceptually, I fully agree. And then I really think that if we had some sort of there's got to be some sort of middle middle ground, I think, because mm -hmm. what you're talking about is like a, and, and you kind of already listed the issue with it. We have to go to every controller and get reflash yeah. them and get them up to script. That is going to take 30 years, um, <clears throat> really, um, probably. Yeah. From and I think anyone that's been in the automation industry, you, I'm, yeah. I ripped out auto pneumatic systems when I first started, mm -hmm. and they hadn't been installed in 20 years. There was like one person. Mm -hmm in a 500 kilometer radius that could work on them. <laughs> yep. Um, so I understand the reality of there's a lot of buildings out there with really old technology. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if someone can come up with a system to grab data, understand it, put some ontology, some metadata, some semantic model to this, mm -hmm. and then be able to work with any system, that, that's going to be incredibly powerful. Someone can do that really quickly and effect effectively. Um, there's a couple of people trying to do this, and I'm, I'm always watching. Um, yeah. But I think that this is super interesting, and there's a bunch of these semantic models out there, like Haystack, Brick, Google Buildings, come up with an ontology recently. Um, mm. So yeah, if you look at the web, they they came with their schema, and that fundamentally changed how the web worked. And mm. I, I really think that it that is a big problem that if we solve today, will completely change our industry. But it's a I, difficult. I'm going to say something a little controversial. And this will be interesting to get your take on it, especially since you work for an OEM. Mm -hmm. um, but my thought process is someone outside of our industry, probably someone like a Google or an Amazon or someone, is going to come up with a stack. I mean, they're going to come up with a stack primarily probably for their buildings initially. Mm -hmm. And then that stack is going to be pushed to – and I'm not going to get into the argument whether Arduino is industrial and capable of doing controls and existing in hostile environments, but some sort of open hardware platform. They're going to come up with that, and they are going to push it into large governmental specs and support it. Their biggest challenge to effectively execute that is going to be the physical execution. Mm -hmm. So this is a little bit of a talk path here. So follow me with this. Mm -hmm. So they're going to have their, the, the people who would come up with the solution are not going to be able to physically execute it. Yep. On the flip side, you have the OEMs and the OEMs, they have hundred million to billion dollar product organizations that are profit and loss centers. And 
they're not going to want to let go of their hardware sales, which are a substantial portion. If you look at their quarterly and yearly filings are a substantial portion of their profit. So you've got that, right? You've got that profit center that doesn't want to let go. Mm-hmm. But on the flip side, supporting all that legacy product is extremely expensive as well. So you've got that piece. Then you've got the licensing aspect that a lot of manufacturers are moving to. And that's some reoccurring cash flow that's really nice. So you got these three kind of variables right there, right? You've got someone building an open technology solution, the OEMs. Now, where I'm trying to think through this and how it executes is personally, and this would be ballsy. This would be something that someone would really have to have some cojones to do, but I think it would position them quite well is to say, okay, you know what? We're going to go to an open solution and we are going to sell services, Mm -hmm. professional services, reoccurring services, and our expertise is no longer going to be selling product. It's going to be selling reoccurring services, um, with much more tie to the life cycle of the building. And we're going to retool our branches and our field organization to deliver that. It'll think, be very interesting. I think, so in my opinion, and I'll speak yep. for myself here, um, <laughs> if you look at what you said about Google or uh, Amazon or Microsoft, I think they will develop a solution and it will be built on their buildings. And I know they're already trying to. Um, mm-hmm. They haven't had much success yet i'm sure i don't and this is you know an outsider's perspective um but i think they're going to do it to sell cloud space and i think it's going to be an online yeah. a cloud solution tool and then your second point is it always comes back down to ownership in the buildings so those big oems are probably going to shift to either having their own solution in the cloud and move mm-hmm. everything to the cloud and keep you know, local controllers still there and have the, the workforce to to maintain that ownership of responsibility um, or just ship to one of these providers' solutions and say, this worked really well. We will maintain the service offering. We'll sell less products. We'll still sell IO in the field. We'll sell less mm-hmm. products, but we will use this as our uh, engine. I can totally yeah. see something like that happening. Now, Google's done some presentations on their, what they're working on. And I mm-hmm. think they're on the right path. I don't know how, I haven't seen it, but I, from what they've presented, it looks mm-hmm. interesting. I think they've got a long way to go, but... If they hire well, if Google or Microsoft or Amazon hire some people from the, from the industry with the right mindset, yeah. I think they could they could really impact. They have a sorry, yeah. have a large impact. I, I think so, and I think what would be interesting, and and it'd be it's a challenge, but it's an interesting challenge, is if you could. Sh- so there's a lot of people who have made a lot of money building on people's tech stacks. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a certain amount of trust to let go of your own tech stack as an OEM and build on a Microsoft tech stack or something like that, or an Amazon tech stack. There's a lot of trust there. The reason I think that is a symbiotic relationship is I do not see the business model of Microsoft or Amazon or Google being in the professional services. I see them as being infrastructure and data and service providers, but the MSP, I see us almost shifting to an MSP model Mm -hmm. and that's managed service provider for people who don't know. And that would be very interesting because I think that could be synergistic. Well, to me, those, I agree. And those companies, they're not, you know, when Amazon releases a new feature in their cloud, they're not, they're not building a feature to then sell it as a provider. They're building it. So people buy more cloud space. Mm -hmm. And that's, I see that relationship. If you go back 10 years, that was an uncomfortable relationship for even any big enterprise, enterprise company. Mm-hmm. But now everyone's accepted Amazon, Microsoft, Google. They're the clouds. Everyone uses them. It's okay. Um, yeah. So already it's like we've taken that step <laughs> to be able to not invest, but like utilize these big, big offerings and make them part of our business offerings. So I think, I think it's going to happen. I think it's just a matter of time. And I think mm-hmm. the point that you raised, which I think a lot of people just kind of gloss over, is there's still a lot of hardware out there and there's going to remain hardware in some form. Who's responsible for the on-site yeah. physical work? That, that's still mm-hmm. going to exist in some manner. It's just a matter of yeah. does your product become commoditized and does it go to the facility managers 
or does it still sit with the workforce and it becomes the OEMs have it become the third party technical support? It could go either way. I'm, I'm glad you see that because that's my big rally against BACnet SC is if we're going to go and do these massive firmware updates and retrofits, because I don't think people think about the fact that, oh, yeah, let's adopt BACnet SC. That's great. That's great. That's great. Yeah. But you're going to be updating probably 90% of the stuff that's in the field right now mm. because it does not have the horsepower or the firmware to support. Like It's one thing if it's a firmware update and you have to download it, but there's going to be a good chunk of stuff that even with a firmware update cannot support a lot of the cryptology requirements and network requirements. And so it'll be very interesting. I think people are trading one system for a new kind of quasi proprietary system. And yeah. I think, and we always I don't get, want to, we, one oh, point I want to make is that they, we always get stuck because of this backwards compatibility problem as well. And that, which no other industry supports I know, except I know. for ours. It's freaking stupid. It's crazy that we, you know, like if you look at any of the big players in our market, they support yeah. their products for forever, basically. I know. And we've, I've never, I've, I had never that. understood that. And I remember when I was installing them, I think when R2, Tritium R2 <coughs> came to end of life, I'm like, oh, this is a joke. I can't believe they're ending life already. And I looked at like 15 years or something. It's something like this yeah. where yeah. not many companies have these time periods in mind when they build something. Oh, no. And the R&D costs, having worked in corporate at a large OEM, the R&D support costs are so high. For that. And actually, it, it delays innovation, in exactly. my opinion. Because you get all these people who were like hardware and firmware engineers. Like I told you early on, um, we're not going to get into who or whatever. But there was a – and I, I honestly, I think it would be fair to say this was across most OC, OEMs. Um, back a couple years ago, there was really a shortage of talent in the AI and data sides of their R&D groups. And that was because, in my opinion – they were supporting legacy product. And so the majority of their principal engineers mm -hmm. were hardware people. They, that's where most of their costs were. Um, okay. Okay. We've went way down this rabbit hole. Uh, that was a deep one too, but I liked it. Yeah. I, I do want to talk about, um, how are you on time? Are you good? I'm fine. I have nothing after. So. Okay, cool. Um, so, I do want to talk about the current environment, people pushing technology, yet tenants are not in buildings and people don't have cash flow. Like, what should people be focusing on? What is viable technology? What is uh, just fluff that you're trying to basically keep your company afloat by pushing people to buy stuff that they don't need? I know that's loaded, but no, I, I am always happy to answer this question. Um, so I think one thing I'll, I'll, I'll fit into this answer with the, we talked about the digital twin on retrofit. So I'll, I'll put that into this as well. Yes. Yes. Um, so I would start by always saying, and this is, this is the issue that we have in our industry is we need technical pre-sales. And that, I say that because it's, it's the only way I can clearly state this. We need people who are selling things that they understand. And that mm -hmm. means technology, like what, what does it take to be able to achieve this? But then what does it deliver to the customer? Um, mm -hmm. So I've seen people go to customers and say, I'm going to sell you a digital twin without looking at their buildings, without looking at their capital budgets, without looking at understanding the operational budgets and mm -hmm. expecting that to be okay. Um, that's not okay. So I think it needs to be an approach of, understanding what is their financial limitations and mm -hmm. understanding what do they need to achieve and then creating a digital plan for them. So I, I call it a, either the digital blueprint or digital language. I think that mm -hmm. could kind of join in my opinion. So let's start with digital twin. Cause I think that's, if you're going to do a digital twin, you plan ahead of time. And you said retrofits earlier. I think we are trying to mimic Silicon Valley in terms of how we present things, how we sell things and oversell things. Um, I think it's the worst traits from the tech industry. 
And mm-hmm. I, the way I always look at this, and, and, and I think we're, we're kind of coming to the, the tail end of this kind of talk, but mm-hmm. uh, if you want a digital twin, it doesn't have to be this virtual reality, augmented reality experience where you're flying through the building. <laughs> There's incremental pr- approaches and steps that you mm-hmm. can take to get a huge amount of value from a digital twin with a fraction of the cost. Mm-hmm. And it comes down to understanding what it is and then what do you need to achieve it. So if you do a retrofit project um, and you say, I'm replacing the plant or a floor or I'm, the new tenant's moving in and we're doing a fit out, that's probably the easiest way. Mm-hmm. Then if you have a plan in mind before that occurs, you can make sure that you capture the asset information, the design data, uh, installation date, uh, make, model, size. There's a bunch of sets of information that you need to maintain that piece of equipment Mm -hmm. or many pieces of equipment and you can just make sure it's collected in the right form now if you Mm -hmm. don't want to do the 3d model that's completely okay you can capture geometry very very easily these days Um, and that's all you really need to be able to do most simulations geometry and new values so material Mm -hmm. values and then that's that's a digital twin you've got a digital twin in all senses of the word to maintain that asset Um, you didn't have to do a you know, one millimeter accuracy on your whole floor plate and you didn't need to put the plants in there. Um, it's really about saying like, let's be realistic. Now, if you're doing it from design, you're already paying for all this BIM modeling. So just make sure they model it in a way that it's useful. Make sure you're modeling maintainable assets separately to the rest of the assets, uh, equipment, sorry. Mm-hmm. I mean, we use assets in Australia's equipment, very confusing. Um, yeah. maintainable equipment. So if it's maintainable, make sure it's modeled by itself and it's to a certain level of detail. Um, mm-hmm. But these things, I think it's all about saying, and it take any other te- technology like data analytics or um, single pane of glass, closed loop optimization, all of these great words and there's value to all of them. But if you just approach them incrementally, they don't seem mm-hmm. so unobtainable. It's really about saying, okay, you want that? You need strong infrastructure that doesn't have bottlenecks. Mm -hmm. You need to collect data in digital form and you need to make sure that this is open, which is probably open up a can of words by saying that, but it's available to third parties to use, meaning the data can be accessed Mm -hmm. by a a gateway, REST API, API, some form of method that you can get data Mm -hmm. out of that building. Um, And then if you do that, you no longer have to finalize the solution and you no longer have to spend all this money on a smart building suite You've just enabled it if you want to do it. And you're already mm-hmm. spending the capital to upgrade your plant. It's not that much extra. In most cases, not any extra to make sure it's available for these digital offerings. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you got the technology, you got the solution in place. Um, and that's all well and good from a construction event. And it's always been interesting to me that BIM has struggled to take off and it'll be interesting to see if this digital twins takes off like i think it would i mean and this is my ignorance uh like i said i'm going to be talking to willow later today kind of try to learn more about digital twins because it was in its infancy when i first started learning about it but is it accurate to say that you could do projections and scenarios with the data that you would gather because to your point the way it was pitched initially a couple years ago was it's a duplicate of your building in the digital world and you know you're going to be able to do everything you possibly could and it was just kind of seemed really fluffy to your point but then as i started to learn more and i started to be like okay well it's I've built Doe eQuest models in the past for IPM VPD, and that was a major pain in the butt. Can it do those kind of things? Because doing modeling of retrofits, doing modeling of sequences, that would be very interesting to me. Yeah, okay. So I think there's a lot there. So I think one, BIM in construction has value. So they're going to do it no matter what because of yeah. time and cost, 4D and 5D. Um, so I think and it, it, it's getting to the point now where they're, they're focusing on handover and that all helps. So I think in construction, if you just remove what we're talking about today, there's value. So they're going to do it. So mm-hmm. on a new build, I think there's no argument that 
it's not it's it's worth it because you can you're going to do it anyway on a retrofit and when you start talking about simulations and and doing retrofit environments i think yes it's incredibly value there valuable there i think um if you make a digital twin just to solve those problems the value might not be there um because if you did it through design and construction and brought it into operations you've already paid for it so that's pretty easy to find value from that mm. but if you're doing it from scratch for a retrofit project i think you need to have a little bit more because what you're talking about are irregular um uh irregular needs so they they're, they're going to occur mm -hmm. infrequently um so i think you have to be able to say work it into your operational plan so it has to be if you want to use this digital twin in operations you have to tie it into the service contracts and the maintenance contracts mm -hmm. they have to keep it updated through these contracts and there has to be some tie into the facility management process so if you do do a fit out service complaints temperature complaints it should be the interface to be able to to address these um now if you think about it if you run a building every year they do a bunch of checks where they have to gather all the asset information this asset register mm -hmm. a digital twin should be a living asset register that that's the value to me and a living asset register doesn't need to have 3D in it in my opinion how how hard is that to maintain because i mean people already struggle to maintain their work order and their asset management systems as they be right now. Mm -hmm. So is this something that's more intuitive? What's the customer experience? So I, like any digital service offering, it always mm -hmm. comes down to change management. Um, you have to have accountability. Yeah, account of, yeah. You, you, if you're dealing with a technical audience and you just throw a tool at them, there's good luck. Like, you know, it's not gonna work. And this, uh, I think you talked about this earlier, but you've seen the market they talk about fault detection analytics. They try it; it doesn't work for them. They give up. Um, mm -hmm. The issue, a lot of the times, isn't that the tool doesn't work; it's that the process didn't change. So yeah, people. Absolutely. So I really believe that if you have, it has. That's why I say it has to be part of that maintenance contract, and it has to be. So it's not someone managing the process; that it's the mm -hmm. tools are finding the issues, holding people accountable, and providing transparency. And then there has to be some sort of change management program. And that's why I don't think there's anything as a, a software solution, a pure software solution for these topics. It's a service offering mixed with yeah, really good software. I, I think that's the big mess is getting companies to position their processes around delivering a service model, not just a solution. Um, that'll be interesting. Let me So let me run a scenario by you and then tell me your thoughts. All right, so a year from now, this COVID stuff's over. <laughs> Hopefully. And uh, yeah, just go with me. <laughs> and and it's and it's over and we've learned a lot. We have figured we've cracked the code. We know exactly what causes it to spread in buildings. And so we come out with IAQ requirements and certain sequences and now we are saying IAQ is a KPI that needs to be measured and reported on, and you need to implement sequence XYZ. And that gets rolled out to all the buildings mm -hmm. as a regulatory compliance. And now we are in a massive retrofit market. How do you think, is that a feasible, even like a 50% chance solution or, or future state? And then how does that affect all of this smart buildings? Uh, because if we enter a massive retrofit market, that seems to be a prime time to rethink rather than just, okay, we're going to install another control set that we're going to keep here for 30 years. And, you know, so I, I think if it gets to that point, one, there's going to be a lot of opportunistic companies, unfortunately. So mm -hmm. I think the first step would be to really heavily educate the, the, the people making these decisions to make sure that they plan ahead. Um, mm -hmm. But I think if we're going to do that, it's going to be, it's probably going to be done through wireless solutions. Um, I don't see us re, re running a bunch of cables for all this new sensing equipment. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of options out there that we've all seen, um, like LoRa or uh, LP WAN or whatever it may be, Zigbee. 
any kind of mesh networking. Um, they have pros and cons that we can kind of skip. But yeah. if, if that's the case uh, and you have to reprogram all these controllers, yeah, it's going to, one, it's going to increase energy a lot. That's going to be the first problem. And a lot of the mechanical systems aren't designed to handle this kind of influx of outside air or whatever it may be. So I Absolutely. think, yeah, if, if it gets to that and there's requirements, um, there's going to be a lot of pressure on building owners and they're going to need yeah. technical solutions to get past this. And I think there will be a level of investment in technology we haven't seen before. I hope we take that opportunity to make sure that we give them the right advice and install mm -hmm. things that have, don't have bottlenecks that actually enable more than one solution, which I think is what happens a lot of the time today. They say, well, mm -hmm. we'll install this and you'll get this. Well, if you just yep. installed something correctly, you could get it all and you could choose what you want. So, yep. yeah, I think that's, that's, that would be very interesting to me. I think um, I would expect that the market would push for some sort of indoor air quality monitoring. They might not know yeah. the terms, but uh, if, if you're sitting in a meeting room and you're feeling tired after an, mm -hmm. 30 minutes of being in a meeting room, because you're not getting enough oxygen. That's not a good yep. thing. Um, so it's not because it's hot most of the time. It's because you've, you, you've sucked in all the oxygen. So you're <laughs> suffocating yeah, to a level. Yeah. People don't realize that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think the average tenant understands that. That's, that's interesting. See, I don't know how it is over in Europe, but over in the US, we're very Sioux happy. Mm -hmm. So I've been telling people, it's just a matter of time till there's class action lawsuit and people saying, oh, we're going to sue the building owner because we got s sick. And so we're going to sue a property management firm. And then next thing you know, the insurance agencies are going like, oh, crap. You know, there's this big claim on our commercial liability. So now we're going to go and mandate that. You know, property management firms have KPIs so that they can show due diligence. Yeah. It's kind of the same thing happened when all these cybersecurity risks came out, right? Yeah, was cool. now in order to have insurance, you have to carry a cyber policy and you have to show due diligence of data protection and things like that. So I don't, like I said, I don't know how it is over in Europe with litigation. Uh, it seems like a lot of that more so comes from the government than it does from like class actions and stuff like that. But um, I mean, what are your thoughts on I think, that kind of scenario? Yeah, I think it always comes down to if you let the market decide, they they might not be the most uh, forward thinking in this um, unless yeah. there's a market value for them. And market value yeah. comes in other forms of saving money or increasing the value of your building. So if it does one of those things and statutory or government requirements, they put a, they basically put a dollar value on it or they put a mandate on it. And then... Either way, you're going to do it. Um, that's uh, We talked about this earlier with the certifications. There's some yeah. healthy indoor environment certifications, which mm -hmm. just simplify this whole discussion. So you don't have to worry about proving yeah. I made your employees more productive. You're like, I improved your rating by from, from silver to gold. Mm -hmm. That's an easy discussion to have now. So it just takes yeah. this whole debate on what's the value. You're like, oh, the value is in your rating tools or the value is in you're now government compliant. And that both of those things, I think, are positive as long as there is an actual benefit to the building owners and the tenants, as long as we don't go too far with this. Yeah, the reset one's really interesting to me. I'm trying to get them. Uh, they're in China, so it's kind of it's difficult to I've, I've, get on the same time zone. I've seen some job ads in um, in Asia where they, yeah. they list their reset rating or the health the indoor uh, the indoor quality air quality levels on the job ad so they're literally huh. using it to hire people saying our building is very very healthy um and i've that because uh, i have a, a huge pop, uh, pollution problem yeah. in their buildings and there's parts yeah. of any major city that's going to experience the same thing it's just not as obvious and it's or it's not as, yeah. as, as uh, dangerous levels but it's going to become yeah. a problem we have to face. And when you have a billion people in your com country, if your buildings and environment are causing health issues, that is a huge federal cost mm -hmm. to your systems. Yep, especially if you have so. healthcare systems. So I think there's there's always a government initiative to do this, or the even if it's if you have a healthcare system for your corporation. 
there's always a reason yeah. to do this and there's probably a lot cheaper to invest in the quality of air in your building than it is to to pay for the health effects to the people huh i wonder if the medical um insurance providers would start providing incentives to companies mm, like health to insurance. provide yeah you know kind of like how the whole fitness craze when it became hey if you provide a fitness program or like a healthy work program, we will go and provide a deduction on your premiums. Mm. I wonder if they'll do that for like IAQ. Like it had to start with sensing, I guess. There's a lot of studies. I could send you 20 studies around this topic about the benefits of having a healthy building. It's just, oh, yeah. it just doesn't seem to be accepted today. That's the thing. It's it's still not widely talk about, talked about, but it's changing. Yeah. Well, I think it's ignorance on part of the – and when I say ignorance, I don't mean that in a negative. Yeah. I just mean that in the purely dictionary form of the word mm -hmm. of not understanding and not knowing, it's ignorance on the part of the tenant around the effects of IAQ. Yep. They don't understand. Yeah, they, they, yeah if, you look at, if you look at any, temp, any building, what's the highest yep. percentage of complaints? Temperature. Yeah. Exactly. How many of them are actually related to temperature? How many of them are related to poor air quality? Like yeah. we don't Flow know. Flow and humidity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think as become people become less ignorant or more educated on this topic, um, mm -hmm. that will change. I think that will definitely change. And this situation has probably accelerated the discussion. Yeah. Um, let's see if it lasts. I don't know. I'm, I'm feeling it from the market that people are mm -hmm. starting to care a lot more. But yeah. only time will tell. I think what will happen is you will see it in the resi market. Mm -hmm. And as people mm. start to learn about AQI and IAQ on their resi thermostats, and they start to learn about humidity and temperature on their resi thermostats, then, because right now that's a premium product mm. to a lot of residential, but as with everything in, in the commercial sector, or sorry, in commerce, it starts as a premium and then it gets commoditized and it goes into the average. I mean, I don't think we're going to see it going into multifamily and stuff. We might, but um, you'll see kind of the more mid range income bracket start to get that technology in their buildings or sorry, in their, in their houses and they'll start to become educated. Yeah. It's kind of like, um, uh, digital lighting solutions. Yeah, H how that became popular, of course. and and now people think about that. No, so I've never I, thought about that, but I think you've nailed that point actually. Because there's already stuff you can buy. You just you know stick on the wall. It connects to your Wi-Fi, and and you've got yep like six or seven sensors measuring air quality, and it's not expensive, relatively. Expensive. Yeah, yeah. Because as I was sitting here talking to you, I'm sitting here thinking to myself. I work in the basement all the time. I really should get a radon <laughs> sensor. Yeah, you should. I, I mean, I was like sitting there like, I should get an IAQ and radon sensor because lately when the weather changes, I get congested. Like I'm really congested right now. And I'm like, is that the indoor air quality in my space? I mean, we've got Merv, uh, Merv 11, I believe, filters. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I mean, I don't need Merv 13. This isn't a hospital. But uh, I mean, we've got that and individual zoning and radiant floors and stuff. And so I think we're good, but yeah, it'd be really interesting. So that's got me thinking like, man, what if I set up a couple IAQ sensors and maybe there's like some VOCs or maybe there's some particulate matter that I'm not aware of, maybe the humidity level. And I can make the environment better for my kids and my myself. And then so I become educated yeah. and I go back into the workforce. And you tell people about it. Like we had a, I had a colleague who <laughs> saw that I was testing some sensors in the office and asked if he could borrow one. And we found that yep. during the day, his particular level skyrocketed and it was yeah. causing him like serious health problems. And he couldn't, he couldn't pick it. He didn't know what it was, but he felt yep. his new apartment was he wasn't feeling well and he thought maybe it's something in the apartment and we it turned out to be the case and they ended up moving out of that apartment like it was quite severe to the point where i got the alert of the level yeah. increase and i rang him like get out of that apartment i don't like i don't know what is happening is it like burning down or something i don't know like it was panic <laughs> levels 
I'm telling you seriously, there um when I used to work in corporate office, there it was a combination of multiple buildings over the years. And there's this one guy who's getting sick all the time. And apparently when they combined these buildings together, they left an outdoor air intake on the side of the building. And that area now became a loading dock. Mm -hmm. And so one day someone went in to the mechanical room and smelt diesel and was like, where's this coming from? And figured out that the outdoor air intake was now right above the loading dock. And so these trucks would sit there and idle. And then that was the outdoor air intake. And so this guy's breathing diesel fumes. Yeah. In a probably sealed room. Yeah. Yeah. And (laughs) then wondering why he's sick all the time. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? It's, it's scary. And it it happens all the time. We've all been on construction sites. We know what can go wrong. Yeah, it's pretty wild. So let me ask you this, because um, we're an hour and 15 in. <laughs> um, what would, or what questions should I have asked you that I did not in this interview? Um, I think we, we covered a lot of topics. So I, I, I always talk about smart building technology. And to mm-hmm. me, I think because I've come from an automation background, I think the one thing people should always remember is that mm-hmm. All of these smart building technologies are built on a foundation of other technologies. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about them or when you're discussing them for, if you're selling those tech to those technologies, they bring them through for you. They help you sell them. But if you're Mm -hmm. delivering them or explaining them to a customer, it's very important that they understand without the foundation technology infrastructure, you cannot enable these. And I think that's what sometimes, it, you know, it might be boring to sell a bass system for some for some people, but to me, that's the most exciting part. Because if you do yeah. it well, it enables these smart building technologies. It's just, it's harder to message that. So that's why people talk around analytics and closed loop optimization and all these interesting topics. But I think we really need to be able to say, there's a foundation level of technology. So always remember, that's the focus to build a very strong technology uh, foundation, an infrastructure mm-hmm. to enable all of these things. And if you do that well, all of this should yeah. be easy. Yeah. That's that's an interesting point because it's that's such a uh, like a foregone conclusion in the technology space. No one goes into building a corporate IT network and is like, oh, screw it. We'll just grab, oh, I got to switch over there. All right, let's put that in. And, yeah. you know, I mean, they just don't. Yeah. They plan it out and they think of future use. And then here in our industry, we're like, okay, we can get the controller that has 10 IO and you're using nine or for 20 bucks more, you can get the 16 IO and have that future capacity. Nope, we want to save 20 bucks. Um, no future capacity for me, and it's yeah, it's it's, mind-boggling. But the worst is when they look at networks and they say, "Oh, I've got an MSTB network. I can just keep that and save twenty percent on my overall install." Yeah. That's that's when the big problems start occurring because now you have bottlenecks, and that's I think it's more. It, a lot of it comes from just a misunderstanding on what that decision means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does. I mean, it's like. And and that's one of the biggest issues, in my opinion, of plan and spec work and poor capital planning um, and not involving automation in the capital planning process. Like, you know, it, it's always been interesting to me that technology is part of the FF&E budget and it's not part of the construction budget, typically, at least here in the U.S., yeah. Uh, and so it doesn't become, I mean, it is somewhat value engineered, but it doesn't become this weird kind of conversation where you've got all of these different contractors providing their voice on solutions that aren't necessarily their area of expertise. But then on controls, you have all these people who don't understand our solutions providing their guidance. Yeah. And it's because on one project they did 20 years ago, something happened. And so from now on, they will never use wireless (laughs) or they will, you know, they will always use MSTP because one data center project they did, you know, middle of nowhere 
had an M or had an IP issue. Well, that's copy so and paste every, every single time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I agree. So. And it's, it's we, yeah, so I think that, but then also just, in, it, we've got to influence the consultants. We have to influence the procurement team. We have to influence yeah. the facility managers building owners. So I, I fully agree. Interesting. I think what would, so um, what I want to do, I want to get you back on a future episode and I want us to talk through a scenario of actually from budgeting, like mm. I'm talking like capital planning to execution. What would that look like? What would the key points? So give you some time to actually like think through that, get some, and let's make it a very structured, because I feel that outside of folks like you and I, there are a good majority of our industry who have never been through that kind of project. Yep. They've never been involved from literally capital planning five, 10 years before something actually happens to the execution and install. Definitely. And I think it would be a experience for them. Yeah. I, and I think people always look at those if, when they don't know the process, they always assume the worst. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. But when you're there and sitting there, you can see every decision's made for a reason, for better or for good. And I think the more we can make people understand why they occur, then we have a chance to change mm -hmm. them. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, cool. So hang on here and uh, I'll stop the recording. We're good to go. Uh, hey, by the way, thanks. No worries. I'm sure my audience is going to be like, yeah, this is cool. I'm always happy to talk so. anything building. All right. Alrighty, folks. So I hope you enjoyed that podcast interview. I definitely enjoyed it. I learned some different perspectives and some different thought patterns from it. Hopefully you took some different perspectives and thought patterns from it as well. I hope that you're coming out of it with some new ideas and some different approaches to how you sell digital services, how you message around digital services, and how you deliver digital services. Hopefully you came out of this realizing that if you are not looking into technologies and broadening your portfolio of deliverables to your customers, then you are going to be in a bad spot in the near future. Also for customers, for owners and operators, I hope you took out of this that there are applicable uses to technology within the built environment that yes, there is a lot of people or are a lot of people out there trying to push stuff on you that you don't actually need because they're trying to survive right now as a business, but there actually is technology out there that does make logical sense for you. Just realize where you're at in your building's life cycle and maturity level and then make decisions for proper technology selection based on the maturity level of your business, the maturity level of your building, and the needs of your building. Uh, once again, as always, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to reach out. Thanks a ton for listening to this episode, and I look forward to talking to you again in next week's episode. Thanks a ton, and take care. Thanks a ton, and take care.